Welcome to our conversations with the candidates for the, for the presidency of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. At CGD, we hope to contribute to the EBRD presidency election process in the best way we can by offering this opportunity for the candidates to discuss their visions for the future of the bank. It is therefore a great pleasure to welcome Poland's Minister of Finance, Tadeusz Kościński, nominee for the EBRD pre presidency. Minister Kościński, welcome and thank you very much for agreeing to take part in this conversation. Thank you very much and thank you for this opportunity, of course. Great. So let me start by asking you what you think the strengths and the weaknesses are of the EBRD as we stand today in the midst of this unprecedented global health and economic crisis. Well, the strengths are undoubtedly uh, the, the biggest asset of uh, uh, of the uh, uh, EBRD is its, uh, its, its staff, its uh, multinational dedicated staff. So uh, undoubtedly that's its uh, greatest asset. It's uh, you know, the EBRD has uh, 30 years of uh, unique experience. Uh, who would have thought 30 years ago uh, uh, it's, uh, where, when the Berlin Wall was falling that, uh, uh, that so quickly the Central European countries could actually move away from the, under the uh, Soviet bloc regime into a a normal free market, so uh, 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 absolutely unique experience, which can be used every, uh, in other places in the world. Of course, so not in the same context of moving out from a from a century planned regime, but uh, a lot of the uh, the, the solutions uh, 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 be uh, used in other areas. Um, perhaps uh, the uh, so one of the things that uh, the EBRD should be doing more is actually using the staff on the ground. Uh, in the transition countries, uh, especially in the in the in the in the, in the uh, advanced transition countries, to actually uh, learn from them what what's will be working, what doesn't work. Because uh, when you when you manage a project from from a distance, you know, you, you see the KPIs and and uh, uh, the projects hopefully successful, but you don't know some of the byproducts. You sometimes the KPIs don't show some of the uh, byproducts that have uh, been caused. The staff on the ground can see that and uh, and can uh, uh, and uh, implement uh, or, or or guard against these uh, sites uh, products in other areas. Another great asset, of course, is the uh, the uh, the shareholder base. It's a tremendous shareholder base, uh, so a lot of information can be tapped in and and uh, taken from the, the the shareholders. And I think shareholder involvement should be much much uh, stronger than uh, it uh, it seems to be at the moment because. That's a tremendous uh, a pool of, uh, of knowledge and, and uh, uh, which can be tapped into. Of course, most important, uh, as usual in any business, is the customer. Is the EBRD uh, using enough uh, 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 feedback from uh, the customers that it's been serving to see how uh, uh, they can actually leverage that knowledge in other areas? Super, thank you. Uh, so. What is your vision for the future of the EBRD? And in particular, how would you use this period to start thinking about the shape of things to come? I think, well, as a, as a banker, as a, once a banker, always a banker, unfortunately, so uh, for my sins, uh, the first thing you look at is that at, uh, who, who are you talking to? Uh, so you look at their, uh, their P&L and uh, the EBRD is a tremendous record. Uh, in just last year, they, did, they had 1.4 billion euros uh, profit. Um, which uh, from from the from the uh, documentation that uh, comes from projects which are in alignment with uh, what the founding fathers of EBRD wanted that uh, to help uh, countries uh, in their transition uh, to a to a modern free democratic uh, environment. So, um, so at the um, macro level, if you look, the EBRD has been very very successful. The countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, over the last uh, few years. The GDP has been growing uh, above average for the EU. So, if you look at it from that point of view, the EBRD is a tremendous success. So, so, so uh, it's 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 making significant profits, uh, and uh, the the countries of operation are actually uh, having a uh, above average uh, GDP growth. But the, the, there is a problem. You know, that's uh, something which should be looked at. Is what are the people? Why why are people migrating out of these countries? To, uh, at the time when the EBRD was uh, uh, extracting value of 1.4 billion, uh, we, 
we in Central Europe have had the biggest brain drain in our history, which is something something's happening there, which has to be addressed. And and really, what uh, what the issue seems to be is that just creating a democratic a democratic uh, society and and uh, you know, putting in projects to make sure that uh, sustainable and inclusive is not enough. Um, it's as we can see from the experience in Central Europe that. Uh, um, what, what's actually happened is uh, uh, the help has actually pushed to Central Europe into the middle income trap. Um, the uh, uh, people have got jobs, uh, it's, it's free and democratic, so from, uh, from a, a, a distance of, of the uh, perspective, uh, it looks like everything's fine. But uh, what's happened is that we've moved into the uh, imitation uh, environment, as I call it. So we're doing the same as something else, someone else is doing in the world. We're just competing on price. And uh, very, very difficult then to move out of that uh, middle income trap. As soon as people want to earn more, they price themselves out the markets and, uh, and, and lose their jobs. So uh, the EBRD should be doing a lot, lot more to move the uh, uh, transition countries, not just into uh, for, uh, uh, inclusive, sustainable growth, but into uh, what they call the uh, innov innovative uh, economy. So uh, people should be uh, not so much uh, uh, are working and uh, competing on price, but uh, on talent. There's a massive pool of talent, talent outside the Western uh, developed countries, which uh, uh, needs to be uh, developed. Now, uh, one of the best ways, of course, is to uh, make sure that uh, the EBRD is working together with the universities. Uh, universities in the, uh, in the transition countries tend to be just pure uh, uh, academic uh, institutions. Uh, as opposed to uh, being partners to, to business. So I think a lot more should be done to actually move universities into be more business oriented. A lot more should be done for research and development in, in uh, these countries. Uh, and uh, that way that uh, uh, we'll try to avoid the middle income trap and uh, go straight into a, a high tech uh, uh, future type of uh, economy. And if you are chosen to serve as president of the EBRD, what would be the top two or three things uh, against which you would like your term to be judged? I think the most important really is uh, uh, in the uh, countries where we uh, we operate, as, uh, as I mentioned, it's it's the people are the most important. It's not the uh, it's not the KPIs that we have in in the bank of uh, how much money we've. Uh, uh, lent and uh, how many of our projects are uh, high on the uh, transition uh, uh, scores, etc. Are the people migrating, leaving the countries where they the, where they are, or are they uh, staying and uh, and uh, hopefully even attracting uh, immigrants into their country, which would uh, reflect that their their life is 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 much better than their positive. So it's not uh, just that uh, where we have the uh, very nice uh, that it's, it's uh, everybody has a job and. Uh, uh, it says free, free media and there's uh, democracy and uh, etc. Um, but also, uh, are the are the people uh, uh, are they voting with their feet to stay or are they voting with their feet to, to go? So listening to the people is quite very important. And also, I think trade needs to be uh, 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 addressed. There's something which doesn't seem to be higher in the agenda. Let's face it. At the end of the day, countries are going to be rich when uh, you spend less than you earn, and to to earn, you have to export. Now, I, th I think uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, countries, both in the op countries of operation, but also in the countries of the shareholders where there's non-tariff barriers. And I think uh, uh, that there is a space for the uh, EBRD to actually be working there to analyze why there are non-tariff barriers in the transition countries, well, what's actually happened and what, uh, what are they worried about, but also to through its uh, uh, shareholder base to, to, to uh, 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 eliminate uh, um, uh, non trade uh, barriers. And, and just looking uh, at the current situation uh, a little bit more, um, how do you think the bank's activities will need to differ from business as usual due to the crisis we're in? And, and do you see any short term or long term changes? to the bank's operations and activities stemming from the current crisis? First of all, uh, the uh, EBRDs were one of the few banks, and not the only uh, multilateral development bank, which has a political uh, aspect uh, enshrined in its articles of association. 
uh, but uh, I think uh, the, the COVID crisis, we can see it's not a national crisis. It's not a crisis uh, for a region or a continent. It's a global crisis. So we all have to work together. And I think uh, the, irrespective that uh, uh, the EBRD has a, 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 this uh, political mandate, it should be working with all other uh, uh, multilateral development banks, financial institutions, and it should be prepared to uh, sometimes uh, uh, take a secondary role rather than uh, always competing to be uh, the, the first. I think there's, uh, there's uh, as I say, uh, horses for courses, and uh, we, we should be ready to, to work together. Of course, where we work together is also going to be changed because the uh, pandemic, there's, I think, two areas uh, which are um, uh, two or three areas which have uh, obviously are going to be changed in the future. One is the health sector uh, and the other one is digital. The health sector, I think, even the rich Western countries uh, are, are having a problem with the health sector. So this is this has to be a, a, a top of agenda for the transition countries because uh, uh, they they have uh, their their problems are much uh, exacerbated. Uh, we they know we know we have to invest more and 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 upgrade the uh, both the the research and development, uh, the production of uh, health products, uh, but also the uh, the medical services uh, they need to be upgraded. So I think very very important uh, that uh, this uh, this is put on the agenda. And the, the second big fallout of the uh, uh, pandemic is that we're all going to be much much more digital. Uh, so, so I think again, uh, going forward, the great the, the divider between the, the 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 poor and the rich is going to be how they use the digital. Uh, so, I think digital infrastructure is going to be very, very important. Education, uh, make sure that everybody has a a, a fair chance of, uh, of of working in the in the digital uh, space. Uh, cyber security, obviously, uh, to make sure that uh, especially the poorer countries uh, aren't uh, uh, under under threat. So. Uh, and and uh, working together between countries because uh, uh, I think digital uh, uh, breaks down barriers, both uh, local and, and uh, national barriers. And uh, I think uh, a lot more uh, will be done there. there. Great, thank you. Um, just thinking a little bit about the climate agenda now, uh, how would you make sure that the climate agenda remains front and center of the EBRD's investments? in the COVID era? First of all, it's not just people in the rich countries that want to live in a clean environment. Uh, uh, everybody wants to live in a clean environment. Uh, uh, it's, it's really uh, uh, what possibilities they have uh, to, to influence the, the, the climate from, from their position. So I think, I think it's a no-brainer that uh, climate is at the front of everybody's and it's market-driven. So, so uh, any, any uh, uh, institution which is driven by the market will have uh, climate at the top of uh, its agenda. It really is um, um, most important to uh, uh, look at the various projects, not, not only from a distance, uh, uh, but also from a local perspective. Uh, all transition countries have uh, different starting points uh, for various reasons, either because of their geography or because of their history. Uh, Central Europe was uh, unfortunately under the uh, the Soviet uh, bloc uh, regime, so uh, they didn't have the choice uh, which country was nuclear, which country was uh, coal, uh, coal powered, etc. So we have to take that into perspective, and also take into perspective how the local community, how ready they are, because a lot of education is required. Just putting in the the uh, clean energy, you also need a lot of education to make sure people appreciate that uh, everybody can uh, do something uh, uh, to to help the uh, the environment. So uh, for for me, the environment is it's 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 everybody is not only talking, and everybody's using it, and be it very odd if. Uh, uh, that wasn't top of the agenda or, or very high on the agenda. Great, thank you. And now moving on to the EBRD's gender strategy. Do you think it's being implemented well enough? Or do you think that the EBRD should be doing more to pay attention to gender, both in its external investments and in its own internal policies and administration? I, th I think we also we have to again have to be very careful on these type of issues because uh, as, uh, very often uh, the gender uh, 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 agenda means making sure that uh, uh, females have have jobs. We have to be very very careful that we this is not just the one benchmark that we use for our gender perspective because very very easy to push people as I mentioned into the. Uh, uh, middle income trap, and uh, in fact, we can be causing more harm than good that way. 
uh, modern business uh, is moving away from rational thinking. Uh, that was, uh, say, 20, 30, 30 years ago. You had IT departments who created various functionality and you, and you sold uh, your products. We uh, competed on price. Nowadays, the most important is the customer experience. And this is why I think it's ever so important to have the right mix of staff uh, 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 on, uh, on, uh, on board to make sure you have uh, a lot of uh, people with rational thinking, a lot of people with emotional thinking. But also other aspects which I think are missing, uh, mature societies look after the, uh, the, uh, the old and the disabled. And I'm not sure that that's uh, addressed uh, uh, enough uh, on the EBRD agenda. Uh, we should also not only be looking at uh, ensuring that there's a fair uh, mix on, on, the, on the gender, but also uh, are we addressing uh, the needs uh, of uh, older people and the disabled at uh, uh, another point there. Okay, so uh, let me then ask you, do you think the EBRD should set targets for measuring the implementation of both the external uh, gender strat strategy, but also for narrowing gaps or Absol improving the gender balance internally? Abs absolutely, but uh, as I said, I uh, have to be very, very careful that we don't have a, a, a binary uh, that uh, we, we meet uh, yeah, there's sufficient number of uh, women or there's sufficient number of older people or disabled people. It's, it, it has to go a lot, lot further than that to make sure that we don't uh, have this false sense that we've uh, we've managed our uh, gender strategy, uh, that uh, we have to make sure that we have to look forward and make sure that we don't push into the middle, the middle income trap. We uh, have to create good quality jobs if we're, in, uh, we're employing uh, a disabled. It shouldn't be just that the number of disabled that we've employed, but are they doing a very useful uh, job and are they uh, taking getting benefit from that uh, as opposed to just having numbers on an Excel spreadsheet? Great, thank you. And now moving on to the EBRD's countries of operation. So what is your view of the bank's proposed expansion into sub-Saharan Africa. And well, what do you the... think, sorry, sorry. Just, just to add, what do you think is needed to enable the EBRD to be really effective in that region? Well, first of all, I think uh, uh, the EBRD should continue to work in all the regions it's currently working in. This, uh, so I think that's very, very important. It uh, obviously it should focus more on the, perhaps the uh, uh, the Western Balkans, the the, the uh, Semed region, the uh, uh, Central and, uh, uh, and so, uh, Southern uh, uh, Europe, etc. So these are areas which uh, uh, they should continue to, to to focus on. As for the Sub-Saharan uh, uh, region, well, we're at this, uh, we need a lot more analysis there and a lot more uh, deliberation. Uh, what's what uh, what we should be doing more. And we should be listening to what the shareholders are saying. I think the shareholders should have a much uh, louder voice, and we should be listening to the shareholders. What what are they they're looking at? And, and uh, as we know, the uh, the, the uh, European Union is going through uh, uh, looking at the the wise uh, uh, men's reports uh, analysis. So uh, let's see what the proposal is on the new uh, uh, arch financial architecture for for Europe will be. And, and what guidance the European Council will give. I think uh, it's not really for the EBRD management to drive that agenda. It's more for us to, to fulfill the agenda being put uh, forward by, by our stakeholders. Great. So you, you mentioned um, the, uh, the uh, forthcoming view on the European development finance architecture. Um, and, and obviously there, there has been the Wise Persons Group uh, report on the future of the development finance architecture, and in particular around the debate uh, in, uh, of the roles of the EBRD and the European Investment Bank. Uh, what are your views on the future institutional composition of European development finance? And again, in particular, how do you see the role of the EBRD evolving in relation to the EIB? I think uh, most important is that for the uh, uh, EBRD not to compete. I think that uh, uh, there's a li there's limited resources in the world, and I think the worst thing we can do is actually compete. We should be working together. We should be uh, uh, making sure that uh, the uh, where where we can take the lead. And then uh, well, EBRD is one of the few, uh, if not the only, uh, uh, MDB which has got a, a political uh, uh, mandate. 
so so uh, where we can uh, help uh, various governments to change their uh, uh, policies, I think that's uh, probably a, 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 the EBRD should be lead, leading. But when it comes to public investment, I think this is more for the EBI, and uh, uh, it's it's where the uh, EBRD should then uh, be uh, perhaps taking a secondary role. So I think uh, the message I'm putting through is that we should be listening and we should we should be cooperating. We should not be competing. That's great. Thank you. I have one final question, really, and and it's it's a bit about you. Um, can you tell us something about your own career and background and, and how your experiences have shaped you to be an effective president of the EBRD? So, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, although um, um, uh, I've got a very Polish name, uh, I was actually born in, in London. Uh, for my parents uh, landed up in, uh, in in London after all because of historical uh, reasons. So I was educated uh, in the city of in London. I worked in the city of London for nearly 13 years. And in 1989, when the uh, uh, when the uh, political situation changed in Central and Eastern Europe, I decided at the beginning it was only for three months. That was 30 years ago. So I decided let's go for three months and have some uh, fun in Central and Eastern Europe and uh, and uh, help them the, on their transformation and. Uh, so I came over. Originally, something which uh, everybody was talking about, but you rarely hear now, was uh, everybody was a company doctor because most companies in Central Europe were state-owned and they they didn't stand the test of moving from centrally planned economies to to, to free market economies. So uh, there's the the call, the the requirement for lots of company doctors to restructure companies to find new uh, uh, shareholders uh, for them. I also worked in in many banks, as so basically from 19, uh, 2015, I worked in various banks, uh, some banks, in fact, with uh, EBRD uh, uh, equity stakes in them, um, doing a lot on, uh, uh, I was working in treasury and in, in IT, trade uh, and uh, direct banking. And Poland, uh, again, this is uh, so why it's so important to use people uh, in of countries of operation, because Countries of operation in some aspects have, have leapfrogged the, the West. Uh, Poland is a, is a global leader when it comes to consumer payments. Uh, just about, in fact, every shop in Poland accepts uh, card payments. It's contactless. 95% of transactions uh, are without uh, PIN. Uh, so, so very, very uh, uh, modern. Um, in 2015, uh, basically, it's my boss. Uh, 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 the, the chief executive of the bank uh, moved to uh, to, be, to the administration to become the deputy premier. I, I followed him, and uh, I was the deputy minister for in, in the Ministry of Development responsible for foreign direct investment. Uh, there, uh, my claim to fame was that uh, I, I changed the uh, special economic zones, uh, which were present in Poland, uh, a relic from the 1990s of the high un unemployment. Uh, I, I changed that uh, the whole of Poland is now a special economic zone, um, and uh, I've moved uh, that uh, the requirements to actually have the license of being an economic zone are not uh, the amount you invest or the how many jobs you create, but uh, how how uh, how much you work with uh, universities, uh, how you develop the supply chain, the good quality jobs uh, you give. And uh, for my sins, last year in the uh, beginning of the summer, I was moved to the Ministry of Finance. I was responsible for uh, for the tax legislation. Uh, my team, we uh, we implemented uh, a new tier for uh, corporate rate tax from 19% uh, for everybody down to 9% for SMEs. Uh, we implemented a 5% tax rate for, for uh, intellectual property, so the uh, IP box, one of the lowest in the world. Uh, we eliminated income tax for, uh, for people under the 26 years of, of age, uh, so we zeroed that out. And uh, uh, I think so. The, a good track record there of listening to uh, what the, uh, uh, the our customers say and working with us. And uh, uh, from November, I'm the uh, uh, serving Minister of Finance. So I had the pleasure of uh, in January having uh, the first balanced budget since 1989 and uh, will probably be the minister at the end of the year who has the biggest deficit in 1989. So it's just fun of being a minister of finance. But um, I, I think one of the important things is uh, the uh, COVID response. We we gave probably the most uh, uh, money back into the uh, 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 economic environment to, to companies, to, to for, comp for people to uh, save their jobs for companies to, uh, to for, uh, not go into bankruptcy. 
and we can see now the benefits. Uh, we hopefully uh, the the, the uh, crisis won't be as as heavy as in other uh, European countries. So hopefully we quickly come out of the the crisis. Going forward, if if I stay, uh, if I become the president of the EPRD, uh, what can I bring? Well, three things really. Listen to uh, the most important to uh, uh, the customers and react and do what they they require. Listen to shareholders and uh, react appropriately. And uh, listen to the staff. It's, uh, I'm I'm a firm believer in listening. It's uh, uh, the the uh, the intelligence is 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 uh, is on the uh, other side. That's great. Thank you very much, Minister. Is there anything you would like to add that we haven't covered? Um, anything at all um, you would like to end with? No, not really. I wish, wish all the my, uh, all my competitors uh, luck. But I think the most important is to make sure that you don't sit in the chair in London and think everybody everything's as rosy or not as rosy, depending on what you think of London. Uh, uh, you actually use the staff uh, in, in uh, that you have. Uh, uh, in the transition countries, I think uh, we've we've uh, the agenda is totally different. Uh, Thirty years ago, as I said, the agenda for uh, EBRD was to uh, move the countries out of the century planned economies. Uh, I think we've shown that uh, these countries have moved very very quickly forward. Some very very talented people, and uh, and uh, worth using them in other, uh, especially early transition countries, to leverage that experience. And that's going to be the real, uh, I think, measure of. Uh, of uh, the success of the EBRD, uh, our, our uh, employees from transition countries, uh, uh, mature transition countries, uh, managing and leading projects in early transition. That's going to show that uh, EBRD is successful. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you for agreeing to set out your vision for the EBRD. It's been a real pleasure, Minister. Thanks very much. Take care.